Hey there, welcome to another update. Um, this update is going to be shorter because not a lot of this, uh, things is happening for a variety of reasons, uh, mostly because the Russians are relaxing and trying to restructure the forces. So I'm not going to go that much in details on uh, the actual combat situation, uh, but uh, more talk around where we stand and uh, where do we go from here and what's the actual situation on the ground. So, uh, firstly, around Kharkiv, Ukrainians are now uh, trying to push up uh, north, right? If before we talked about Russians trying to push, now Ukrainians are trying to push it, but uh, there has been not a lot of success in their areas reported, so nothing much is happening there. Uh, then, around the uh, Izum area, we know that Russians are still trying to kind of slowly kind of try to push this to this part, but uh, they're not successful. They try to, after taking Lysychansk, go on and push kind of forward from this area. And then they got heavy, heavy casualties, heavy hit right here, and they stop advancing from this side. Um, otherwise, it's mostly shelling, 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 shelling everywhere. So it's, uh, it's basically uh, Russians right now, their main forces are relaxing and it's kind of just the the substitute of the artillery forces that are just shelling so that the enemy side doesn't get um, a lot of relaxation in. So there has been like a small push around uh, Vuklidar here. So this area, Ukrainians have been able to come here and seize a village here in the past couple of days and that's about it. Uh, well, obviously, besides shelling, 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 but I guess we kind of know. Uh, we know that Ukrainians tried to push a little bit here, but they were stopped uh, and nothing much happened here. Uh, around uh, Kherson probably is the biggest activity right now. So we get from day to day, a day, uh, maybe a village or a two uh, gets liberated by the Ukrainian side. So like smaller to gain here, small gain here, small gain here and so on and so on. It's happening all across this kind of large area, so it might happen here, might happen here, and so on, right? So it's it's slowly Ukrainians are trying to get village by village by village by village, but there is a lot of villages. This, this is a huge area. So nothing that is wor noteworthy that is happening here. That's that's the basically situation on the fronts right now. Um, we are basically waiting for the Russians to figure out how they want to attack next because Ukraine doesn't still have the forces to counterattack. What Ukraine does have is a huge initiative with the, with the HIMARS system. So the weapon systems with the long range artillery, as I explained, the West was looking to find what kind of weapons are actually effective in this war in Ukraine. And they basically just hit the jackpot because the problem of the Russian army, and this is very important, like, so, so bear with me. So the problem of the Russian army is it's big. One would say, hey, why would be that be a problem, right? It's a, it's a big army. So what? You just, just, just have more of everything, right? It's just scale. Well, unfortunately, not the kind of army that the Russians are having. So the the army that Russians are having is, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna use the map as a, just a canvas and I draw. So there is is a lot of a lot of like uh, you know like meat. I, I would say like meat for the meat grinder. So a lot of grunts, a lot of, a lot of um, low ranking uh, privates that are knowing uh, what to do just in the basic concepts of it. And then there is basically some commanders that like maybe one, two, three commanders, which is all nice and good. And they're commanding these grunts to, to go and do their jobs. The problem with this is because this part, the, the majority, the grunts are, uh, it's quite poorly man maintained the commanders actually, and because Russians have really bad, uh, really bad, uh, um, what is it called, like radio connections, like really bad, uh, just general 
uh, ability to convey their messages over longer uh, areas. So the command line needs to be quite short. So it's basically this person needs to go directly almost to the grunts and explain to them what they need to do. Basically face to face, almost like, almost like face to face. And it's happening the same thing here and so on. And these are guys already like, you know, like officers. And I'm telling you as a person who doesn't understand anything about the army and how it works, I'm just regurgitating the problem. Uh, so then these officers have the higher officers. And because there is such a big, pro big problems in Russian army that these officers that want to tell these officers something, they also need to come close to the, to the front lines. So what this creates is a paradox. So if you take out some of these command officers, you get a lot of grunts that don't really know what to do. This is very op opposite to what the Western style is when we have the small independent groups of fighters or like squads that are able to be almost autonomous, even if the command chain breaks for some period of time. That's not how the Russian army operates. So if this part is being damaged, then this part, the huge part, is not operational. And I think that's quite simple to understand. This creates problems. This creates something that the officers in that, that part to command, they basically need to be very much closely together. So they need to have command spots on the field. And because they need to be essentially telling the grunts what they need to do, they need to be closer to the battlefield. And this is the problem for the, for the Russian army in a sense of what the HIMARS are doing. The highly precision missiles, together with great intelligence that Ukrainians are getting, right now we can say for sure that Ukrainians know a lot of good stuff. Like they are targeting all the all the major facilities that the even the Russian side, all the bloggers and everything are now completely agonizing over it. So that is the problem. So a lot of that army that can be a huge army, but it's going to be commanded by just some officers that need to be somewhat close to the battle lines. They cannot be far because then everything just falls apart and becomes ineffective. That means they're becoming targets. That is one thing. Second thing is the same that big army requires a lot of resources and, and requires a lot of supplies for those resources. And we already seen from the phase one that the Russian logistics are to put it mildly, not the best. And that not the best attitude means that they need to be essentially as dumb as possible. So even the most simpler thing understand because the Russians, they don't have advanced logistics. They don't have advanced logistic vehicles. They don't have like multi loaders or, or anything like equipment. They're literally like trucks of weapons that the grunts need to unload with their bare hands and then basically just distribute by carrying them all. It's literally like World War I, World War II kind of stuff. And uh, this creates the problem because that means that to support a big, 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 big army requires to have huge stockpiles of these equipment. If it's a decentralized chain like with, with a lot of smaller uh, stockpiles. It requires a lot of well-organized logistical coordination for that to be operational. I'm pretty sure, like, I, like this is, thank, thankfully, I'm not a complete direct expert, but I've been working closely enough with supply chains for a while to actually know just how complex this can get. And when you say, oh, we trained, like, a couple of uh, lorry drivers and, like, people organizing this shit like, you know, for a couple of months, that is nearly not enough. And I'm not even talking that when like half of the connection and, and resp response systems, like it's a problem organizing the things when you have the GPS of all the drivers with complete uh, uh, up-to-date control of where they are, when they're going, what's the status of their deliveries. And if we're talking like organizing this event around the 1,400 kilometers front line, with like old Soviet trucks with no connection whatsoever, it quickly becomes completely, completely useless because 
there's going to start appearing holes. There's going to start appearing deliveries that are never going to be delivered. Then there's going to be some random stockpiles that were not supposed to be there. Things are going to start getting lost. Everything that's going to happen is going to completely turn to chaos in a matter of weeks. So that creates a big pressure because so far what they've been doing is they've been having like, you know, large stockpiles here, 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 everywhere around the map. And now because of the HIMARS, all these stockpiles have been hit during the past weeks. And that is a big problem because this is a second big problem for Russian as even if they, for example, mobilize, even if they mobilize their economy and everything in Russia that they want to do, the larger army they create, the more the concentrated and the more uh, centralized these facilities will need to get. Because as the more people with poor um, training you have in the army, the more essentially and more dumber your tactics must be. That's literally the problem that is Russia cannot win in this quality army, in quality warfare scenario that they're going to have. Because as more and more these high precision 21st century HIMARS start rolling in, the Russia is going to start getting problems. And one might ask, well, why didn't we hear high about HIMARS before? Well, because the HIMARS were deployed in Afghanistan, for example. Well, Afghanistan is not nearly as organized. Like, and, and where is the front line in Afghanistan? Well, that's a good question because it's mostly like a guerrilla warfare. And obviously, a big long-range missile rocket uh, launch system, when there is no major targets, is not benefiting that much. The the long-range missile systems like HIMARS, like M270, however, against the Russian army that has a lot of these grunts that needs to be on the front line and push and and fire artillery as a uh, and and fire are like twenty thousand rounds of artillery per day. They need the stockpiles of everything. So this creates two big problems that the, by the nature of the Russian army, they need to start having concentrated. Uh, positions that are not too far from the front line and they need to have them highly centralized that's because that's the nature of the army and then they also need to both centralize both the equipment and the manpower like the officers and that is a huge issue i'm not saying that this is not a solvable problem for the Russians. I'm pretty sure that Russia will be able to adapt just as a way that they've been adapting to fight the drones that Ukrainians are having, right? Uh, that they, The way that they've adapted the warfare to not be exposed in their supply lines uh, uh, from the first part of the invasion, right? Well, I, I wouldn't call it adapted because the first part was more like a, like a, they tried to do Blitzkrieg, they tried to be fancy, and then the second part, they just kind of rolled back to what the Russian army just usually does. So all in all, the problem that Russia right now is having is an existential and it's a deep to the core one. And there is no good scenario right now that is on the site how Russian military can solve it. And the more they cannot solve it, the more time Ukraine has, the more weapons will roll into Ukraine. So then the Ukraine can deliver nice and deadly blow to the Russians.